Oh, oh yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So many things. And then so I'm going to. So Elena, the YouTube stream should be starting. Yeah, you're right. Okay. I really need to. I was like, oh, guy. it's showing my face from my my office yet. No problem. That's not. If he's here. Interesting. Oh, oh no. It's not showing on YouTube, is it? Oh, oh there we go. There we go. Okay, good. All right. Price oh. is averted. Yep. <laughs> just about to. I don't envy you guys. No. Yep, just about to freak out a little bit. So now what I need to do is I need to share it. And I'm going to start recording just in case. This is liquid cloud. And going to. What's the next? I need to share my screen. Are you seeing my, um, actually I can yes. see, there we go. Okay, so sharing my screen and now I'm gonna go ahead on Zoom and let everybody. Katrina, can you go ahead and let everybody in? Okay, so now. Okay, so sorry. Thank you for my the online participants. Thank you for your patience here. And thank you to the, everybody who's in the classroom here for, um, for joining us. So uh, my name is Jennifer Summers. I am the Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. And I am partially responsible for organizing this seminar series along with Katie Sartini. And this is a seminar series that we host um, every year. Um, so I would like to remind you to please save the dates for the upcoming seminar or series in this seminar. Um, of course, we have Katie Sartini, who's going to be presenting on the Black Bear Project next week. And then our uh, uh, seminar with uh, Wabishka Benisque of the Ojibwe tribe, she, her, her talk was rescheduled for March 30th, and she is going to be live in person. So please um, make sure you, you come to that talk. That's going to be an interesting one. Not that Katie's isn't. Hers is going to be awesome, too. So make sure you show Katie some love and show up to the, her talk. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody who helped organize this seminar series. Um, this is the CNR Spring Seminar Series. So we always do this in cooperation with the College of Natural Resources. And the DNR assisted us with planning this this year by helping us identify speakers. And um, we had a couple of speakers from the DNR, um, particularly Randy Johnson, um, carnivore specialist, helped us um, with this organization or with this uh uh, series. And then also UW Extension, thank you to them as well. Um, Scott Hingstrom, who is the uh, director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. He is an extension pro uh, professional or uh, extension specialist, excuse me. And so everything that we do is partially an extension um, project. Or um, So in addition to other acknowledgements, I'd like to um, acknowledge our, go through this acknowledgement as well. Um, we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And with that, um, Katie is going to introduce our speaker. Okay, today we have with us Dave Telesco. Dave earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Forestry and Wildlife Resources in 1996 from Virginia Tech and a Master of Science degree in Wildlife Science in 2003 from the Virginia, I'm sorry, from, from the University of Tennessee. He worked for five years for the nonprofit Black Bear Conservation Coalition before coming to Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in 2008 to serve as the Black Bear Management Program Coordinator. Davis served as one of two assistant leaders of the imperiled species management section, which includes black bears, panthers, manatees, and sea turtles since 2023, which I have to say, Dave, is pretty, that sounds like a pretty diverse uh, job title, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that sounds like something we'll have to talk about later, I think. All right, uh, Dave has over 20 years of experience in research and management of black bears with a focus on how to mitigate human bear conflicts. So if we're thinking about how this fits in with our seminar overall, we specifically asked Dave to come talk about the BearWise program here because I think that it's not 
a good idea to talk about bears in general, unless you are also talking about how we live with bears. And I cannot think of a better program to talk about that with than to talk about that as, as it relates to bear wise. So Dave, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Absolutely, I'm glad to do it. All right. And then, so welcome our speaker and you're welcome to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Dave. All right, let me do that. The, turn the volume up a bit here. Make this just be like make this go on. Oh, yeah, let's just do if we just do that. There you go. And that's just done. There you go. Oh. All right. Are, are we yeah. all set? Are you seeing a big old bear? We are yes. seeing a big old bear. Indeed. Okay, good. <laughs> good. All right. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm I'm always happy to talk about bears and very excited to talk about bear wise. Um, so as, as she said, I, I was the bear management program coordinator for Florida Fish and Wildlife for 14 years, and I just became the assistant uh, section leader. So um, I'm really pleased to talk to you about my experiences there and, and basically bears in, in Florida and how Bearwise fits into that big picture. So I want to start out with what we call the leaning J, and it basically applies to any wildlife species in North America, where you start out with a whole bunch of animals, and then you work through time and see how they were managed or not managed um, to see where you are on this curve. So we start out, you know, when there were, you know, European settlement, we think maybe we had over 11,000 bears in Florida uh, in the 1500s. Um, so this is the abundant phase uh, in the J curve. And so we, we have little or no management happening. And this is pretty standard uh, across North America. Um, and in this case, not only was the species itself overexploited, the habitat was too. Um, it was, wow, there's endless forests, there's endless animals, let's take advantage of those. So there was no management whatsoever. So then that moves you through the, into the rare and the recovery management phase of the J curve. So in the 70s, uh, the agency responsible for uh, wildlife here said, look, we're in trouble. We, we think maybe you only have 500 bears left in the state. So they listed it as a state threatened species, not federally threatened under the Endangered Species Act, but a state threatened species in 1974. And what that triggered was a bunch of research and a bunch of funding to try to figure out what is it that's going to make this, this uh, species come back. And one of the things was protections. So let's protect the habitat, let's protect the species, let's see what else they need to survive and thrive. And so they did bounce back. So what we're looking at here is in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, we're seeing a big rebound. Um, but when you come out of recovery management, you have to go into this phase called conflict management because now, you go from in the 70s with only 500 bears, now you've got 2,500 bears in 2002. So people have been living in these areas near bears, but have no idea what they're supposed to do to avoid conflicts with them. And a lot of them, frankly, are like, why should I have to change how I am? I've lived here for 30 years. So it, it's really a challenge that, that, again, every species kind of goes through. It's a little more severe with some species than others. So, then we have our, our more recent estimate, and you're talking about, you know, that's not a long time, between 2002 and 2015, to have 4,000 bears. Um, and we're moving along this curve, you know, how many bears do we have? Where are we on the curve? Ideally, where you'll end up is a sustainable coexistence, where you've got stable populations, um, animals are living where you would expect them to live, and the people that are near them know what to do, and there's not as much conflict. We are certainly not there in Florida, but um, I hope that I can show you today that we are doing what we can to get there. So I've taken it really briefly through this history, um, but I want to focus on just, you know, probably like a five or six year period where things in Florida completely change because of a series of events. Um, and I wanna explain that to you. I think that helps you understand where we came from and why we're doing what we're doing. And, and fortunately for me, 
I was around for most of, of these changes. So to let you know where we were from a conflict situation, um, you know, we track calls and we track bear calls uh, and we call them either core complaints or non-core complaints. So core complaints are the bears in my garbage, the bears in my house, the bear in my chickens. Non-core complaints are, I saw a bear when I was hiking or I saw a bear on the side of the road. So these are, are sightings or things that don't require some sort of technical assistance to intervene. <clears throat> so between 2003 and 2007, that's a pretty big jump in calls. The other thing is to notice is the percentage of core versus non-core, it's fairly high. You're talking about an even split. So that means that we're doing a lot with each call that comes in versus let's say if it was a, a lower percentage of core complaints, um, then we're just giving some information and moving forward. So we start building the first statewide bear management plan in 2007. And we decided to do it a little differently than some other states. We said, look, we know there's a bunch of people interested in bears in Florida. Let's create a group so that they can have input on what this management plan looks like. So we created a statewide bear technical assistance group, which I'll refer to as TAG. And it's 38 organizations that are representing Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, but they're also representing nonprofits. And, and they reviewed eight different drafts. So we would give them a first draft, they would give us some feedback, give them a second draft. So a lot of interaction, a lot of regular uh, contact. So who, who were these people? So you're talking about sister agencies like Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Florida Forest Service, but then you're also talking about federal. So Eglin Air Force Base, uh, US Forest Service, uh, Florida Department of Transportation, University of Florida. So a bunch of partner agencies, then a lot of nonprofits. And you're talking about couldn't be any different than each other in some cases. Um, so while we had the Central Florida Baron Association, we also had Humane Society of the United States. Um, and believe it or not, we had them sometimes physically sitting down together to meet with us, which was interesting. We also had businesses. Um, in some cases, these businesses were interested in bears because what we did in our bear management plan might impact population of, you know, where people are allowed to be. So maybe they comment on development or maybe like in the case of Waste Pro, they're going to be interested because, you know, bears like garbage. Um, so, you know, several different businesses were involved as well. So in the midst of us doing this management plan, the agency decided to review all 64 state listed species in 2010. So we'd already been three years into this process. And what the agency said is, look, different species got on this state listed list with different criteria. Let's 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 make all of them go through the same universally accepted criteria. So we use the IUCN red list criteria, which is internationally known. And one of the things we said was, look, if you're going to delist, if you're going to take it off that list, it has to have a management plan, which makes sense. You don't want to take something off of, of a threatened species list with no plan to make sure it won't go back on. So in 2011, biological status review of the bear said, hey, it's not at risk. So we have to change the management plan a little bit to, to fit um, this new thing. So I refer to 2012 as the year of the bear, okay? Because our bear management plan was approved after five years of working on it. We passed the bear conservation rule and the bear was delisted. So this is a big deal. So the bear conservation rule, again, it was put in place in 2012 and then we amended it in 2015. But what it said was the bear is a protected species. If we did not do this, the bear would fall into this weird amorphous area. It's not a game species, but it's not a threatened species. It's just wildlife. And so we wanted to elevate it a little bit more. So it's a protected species. Uh, in 2015, we added the depredation permit in situations where um, you know, we could not resolve the issue and the bear was defeating, say, electric fencing or something like that. But the other thing we did was we wanted to make sure that one of the things that we say is we really want people to scare bears. 
Well, we didn't want them to be looking like they're in violation of the rule. So we specifically put in there that it's okay to scare bears with methods recommended by FWC. And two of those methods we allow the public to use on bears are paintball guns and slingshots. We also talk about how security personnel like sheriff's offices or local police, they can haze bears with advanced methods, but they got to go through training with us first. And then, and then the last thing on the rule was we will comment on land use change and development. So one of the things that the bear management plan uh, established was, hey, we've got seven areas across Florida that have bear populations. Uh, and we want those to, we're calling those bear management units. We want each of those areas to have a stakeholder group. Now, this is not the tag. These are not organizations. These are people who just represent themselves. So we traveled around the state in 2013 and recruited people who are interested in bears. Hey, why don't you come meet with us three or four times a year? We'll talk about bears. You can talk get your concerns with us and give us some local input. And so we established that in 2013. So where are we on the scale now? So now you're seeing that it just keeps going up and up and up. Um, you know, in 10 years, we went from 1,100 1, calls to 6,700 calls. And you can see that split is still pretty even, which is not good. We don't want it to be a 50-50 split with core and non-core. So we're, we're coming to a head here. And then it happened. In a 13-month period, four people were seriously injured by black bears in Florida. Before this time, a handful of people have been injured across several years, but this was a shock to the system. Um, I mean, National Geographic did an article, why are black bear attacks up in Florida? Um, this was on you know, New York Times, everywhere was covering what is going on. Um, and so we really shifted gears and, and started looking at this as a whole different ball game. And one of the things we did, we went to the legislature because they are saying, what, what is going on and what do you need to, to address this? So we said, hey, we need some more funding. We need some more staff. So what that resulted in is we have the largest staff that are specifically dedicated to bears. So we have five, what we call them area bear biologists, who are responsible for different parts of, of the state. And each one of them has five or six what we call bear response contractors. These are private individuals that we train. They can help us with trapping, site visits to talk with people about bears, all that sort of thing. So we basically have a veritable army of people that all they're focused on is dealing with bears and human bear conflict. We also produced a waste management uh, policy paper and our commissioners passed a resolution. And this is important because basically it says, look, yes, our agency is responsible for bears, but this, is, this involves everybody. Everyone has a role. Local government has a role. The waste companies have a, a role and the residents have a role. And so this was really important to establish that. Um, we, we, we spoke with local governments and waste management, how we can work together. Our commissioners actually got memorandum of understanding with waste pro and waste management that they said, we will work with you. We will allow to, you know, we will offer bear resistant mm -hmm. products. So this is a, a really big deal for us. Now, we did have a feeding rule in 2002. We added bears to a feeding rule that says you can't feed raccoons, foxes, and then we added bears. Well, in 2015, we decided to separate bears from that feeding rule and make their own. And we separated out intentional feeding and unintentional feeding. Intentional feeding is prohibited, period. Now, unintentional feeding, as in I put my garbage out on the curb the night before pickup, or I put my bird feeder out, um, it's only prohibited if it attracts bears, it's likely to create a nuisance, and one of our officers from FWC have issued a written notice. Now, it's not a warning and it's not a citation. So it's not really an official law enforcement action. It's just saying, hey, we have this rule that you may not be aware of. And what you're doing could put you in violation if you have to come back. 
So now all of a sudden we shifted to, it's not just the bears are going to pay, where you need to put some additional responsibility on the public. We also changed penalties for feeding rules. Um, the animals that you see in these pictures, we have a specific rule that says you can't feed them. And I wish I could tell you we did not have free ranging monkeys, but we do, just saying. Um, so before the change, any offense for feeding was gonna be a second degree criminal misdemeanor. Well, you can imagine that a judge is not gonna be super happy about giving you know, somebody who just put their trash out the night before pickup a criminal record. So we said, okay, let's back it up. That first offense, that's gonna be just a hundred dollar fine. There's not gonna be any criminal penalty level. And that way, if, if someone does continue to be a problem and not comply, they've built a pattern. They've got a notice of non-compliance. Then they got this first civil offense. So it kind of builds a history for a reason why a judge may say, yeah, you're, you're, you're gonna get that citation. And then for bears, alligators, and crocodiles, we wanted to ramp it up and say, look, if you feed these animals, you are creating a public safety risk. And um, fortunately, there's only one entity that got a third offense um, and we dealt with them. Uh, to my knowledge, we've never had a fourth, so that's good. The other thing we did was we changed our approach to bears. Um, we had some habituated bears that would spend all their time in the neighborhoods and we went in and put them down. So just to give you a frame of reference, we killed 103 bears in 2015. Previous five-year average was 26. So I lost staff, I'll be honest. Um, they were not comfortable with that policy, um, but I understood why we needed to do it. And in a lot of these cases, there was no question that these bears had just developed a relationship with people that was not safe. So the other thing that we did was we re reopened uh, regulated hunting. The last regulated hunting season we have is in 94. And what we did was we developed a quota hunt. So if you reach that certain number of bears, the hunt was shut down. Hunters had to call every day to see if the quota was met. And if it was met, they couldn't hunt the next day. We didn't allow dogs. Um, bait, if you're gonna hunt in an area that has bait for deer, Number one, that bait has to be non-processed. So it has to be just straight corn or straight peanuts or something like that. Um, and the hunter and the bear would need to be over 100 yards away from that bait. So basically, you're not allowed to use dogs. You're not allowed to use bait. The idea was we wanted to slow the growth rate of our population. We don't want to reduce the population. We want to slow the annual population growth rate. So what would that take? So the idea is if you want to stabilize a population, you want removals to offset additions. And it's not just deaths offset births, because a lot of those births don't, don't result in an animal entering the population as an adult. So it's really deaths offset recruitment. And so our population, the demographics of our population would require 20% annual mortality to have a stable population that's not growing. So what you'd have to do is look at what do we know about how many bears are dying from being hit by cars or we're killing for conflict or illegal kill. You take that number and then you figure out, okay, how close is that to 20%? What's ever left, that's what's left for hunters. So the hypothetical example I have here is say you have a thousand bears, 20% would be 200 bears need to leave the population because we know bears are coming into the population, so there'll be no growth. Well, if 100 bears we know are hit by cars or we remove, that leaves 100 bears for hunters to take. So that's that was the idea there. So of the seven bear populations we have, we only opened four. There's the four largest that we knew the most about, we felt most comfortable. So for example, the East Bay Handle, over 1,000 bears, if it was 20%, that's 212 bears. We knew that non-hunting mortality was 80. And during the hunt, 114 animals were taken. So that's 194 animals. It's over the 20%, but it's not over to the point where we were concerned. 
And you could see that of the four, two of them actually were able to slow or prevent population growth. The other two, we were not. Um, so we wanted to get, you know, 320 animals and we got 304 during the hunt. So uh, what were the positives and what were the negatives of our hunt? So two of the four didn't grow. That's successful. We had full control over the hunt and that was good because the hunt was supposed to go for a week and we ended it in two days. Um, minimal enforcement, people followed the rules. We did not have much of violations. Well, what needed improvement? That quota that we put on the hunters put a lot of pressure on them to harvest in case they couldn't hunt the next day. So they didn't, they weren't very selective. If they saw a bear, they took it. Um, and so, you know, that was not a good experience for them. And it caused all these bears to be harvested in two days. The public was not ready for that. And our messaging to the public was drowned out. Um, we could not communicate why hunting is important, why it's actually good for the population. Um, and so it really, it, the message was lost. So in 2016, we did not continue the hunt. And in 2017, our commissioners asked us, hey, your 2012 plan doesn't talk about hunting at all. I want you to update that 2012 plan to include what measures are available to manage populations. So we included regulated hunting. We included um, you know, sterility or drugs that you could uh, immunocompromise them. Uh, sharpshooters, habitat management, all different ways you might be able to, to impact a population. In addition to obviously updating all the data from 2012 to 2019. So in 2019, the commissioners approved the management plan and they said, hey, hunting is an important tool. We are not asking for it right now, but at some point we might. So that is where hunting has been left in Florida. So this is where we are in Florida today. So you can see that calls peaked out in 2013, 2014, and something even more important happened, which is all of a sudden, the non-core complaints start shifting to more percentage. And we feel like a lot of the things that we are doing are the reason for that. We know that a thousand people move to Florida every day. So we're not gonna be able to control volume of calls, but if we can institute some things to make sure that the folks who need help are getting it and we can maybe prevent some conflicts, that's, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. So that's why, you know, yes, I see that we've got thousands of calls, but a lot of them are not uh, the core complaints. So before I get into what we've been doing, I want to show you where the bears are. So uh, normally you see a range map. It's like, there's where the animals are. Here's the not. Well, bears have been everywhere at some point in Florida. Um, and so the dark brown is frequent. We would frequently expect you to see them. And then the lighter brown is common. So you combine those two and basically bears are in 50% of their historic range. That's pretty impressive with a state that's got 21.5 million people. Uh, we have over 4,000 bears. You can see they're not equally, equally distributed throughout the state. Um, and based on our growth models, we probably have 7,500 at this time. The 4,000 numbers from 2015. So some of the common things we see here, I'm sure you guys see as other places, um, bears like to get into all sorts of things. Now, most people are not foolish enough to feed them by hand, but some people do. Um, you know, grills, pet food left out overnight, bird seed, wildlife feeders, and then garbage. Those are our, our big ones. So when you look at all of our calls over time, the good news is even though calls have been increasing, um, the serious, most serious calls are still a very small percentage. 1% public safety incident, 1% in structure, 3% bear animal encounter. And look at that big chunk, 29% specifically say bears are in our garbage. Another 40% are saying the bears in my yard, the bears in the area, or the bears up a tree. So really 69% of this pie we can control because we can control how much food is on the landscape from us that are encouraging bears to be there. And of the over 5,000 calls we get each year, 
75% start and finish on the phone. 23%, we're not sure because what they're telling us doesn't line up. We want to go out and talk to them. Only 2% result in a trapping effort. And this is where bearwise comes in. So we have a growing bear population. We have a growing human population. So do most other states. And so as part of the Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, there's 15 states. We got together and said, look, we're, we're saying a lot of the same things. It'd be really nice if what, what I say in Florida is the same thing as what you say in Tennessee, because you know they're gonna come vacation here. Let's just have some consistent messaging. That sounds simple, but to get 15 state biologists to agree took six years. So six years later, um, we were able to launch this website that the main focus, it helps people live responsibly with black bears. That's it. And it's a bunch of state biologists paired with some communication specialists who know how to communicate this stuff better than us. Um, and so, you know, started with 15 states. In 2022, it became its own nonprofit under the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And I'm pleased to report that we have 37 member states right now. So really, when you see that paw print, what we're saying is what 37 states are saying. And that's a miracle um, that we can all say the same thing and have the same messaging. So again, why, why is this so important? Why, why become part of this group? Consistency in messaging. Whether I live in North Carolina and I vacation in Colorado, I'm gonna see the same messaging over and over. I'm going to see the same graphics representing that message. And, and the other thing, too, is it's hierarchical. So we all had to agree on these three or you know five words, which was really hard, believe it or not. Never feed or approach bears. Okay, well, that's good. Then you click on that, and there's a couple of sentences that we all agreed on. And then you keep reading, and there's more and more information. And, and so you, you have that opportunity just to have a brief touch of it, and maybe of the six bearwise basics, only one is interesting to you. Well, that's fine. You can learn more about it. And, and again, each state brings what we have, our resources to bear to make sure that we're saying some things that, that make sense for our state too. If you've ever been on a state agency website, it is a nightmare. And I don't know why it has to be, but it seems like it has to be. So the bureaucracy of state agencies make that our websites are really clunky, Hard to find stuff, even when you know you're looking for it. Bearwise is not. This website is easy to navigate. And not only that, gorgeous pictures of bears, great use of graphics, just all in all, a good experience and inviting for people to try to find more information. And when you have all these states working together, we get to share ideas. So we came up with the, the boat whistle, and now that's Bearwise. And so you know, each state, some, one state had magnets that are designed like a bear. Now we all have magnets designed. So we got to kind of pull our resources. And now each one of these items that they design, there's a blank space. You can put your, your logo for your state on there. So it's, it's really, it's fantastic. Now, three or four states decided to take it a step further. We decided to say, look, there's Bearwise. That's all about outreach, consistent messaging. Let's recognize some of these communities are doing the right thing. So what we decided as a group was if you follow the six bearwise basics, you can be considered recognized as a, as a bearwise recognized community. We, Florida, put on more specifics. We said you have to meet all bearwise basics, plus I want you to require trash to secure and has a mechanism to enforce that. So you can't just say, yeah, we're bearwise, we do everything right. And if someone doesn't, there's no repercussions. So that's that's what we decided. So I want to point out our first Bearwise community. This Bearwise community was one of the four people, I'm sorry, the, the community, there was one of the four people who got seriously injured in 2013 was a member of this community. And they decided that I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known for doing the right thing. So they stepped up that board of directors and they approved really strict bylaws, not just trash, pet food. It restricted, if your, gar if your garage is open and you're not in it, 
it, it's only a limited time before you can have you have to have it closed. So all these sorts of things, and they were very aggressive in finding violators. And within a year, their problems went down, and people's violations went down, and bears just walked right through. They had no reason to spend time in that neighborhood. So ultimately, we end up with five bearwise uh, recognized communities right now. We're working on more. Two of them were in the Panhandle. So one's an Air Force Air Force base, uh, uh, Hurlbert. One's a, an HOA, Cypress Dunes. We've got two um, in the Central, which is Wingfield North, Wingfield Reserve. And we got one in the South. This is actually a golf community. And I will give kudos to them because they actually didn't have that many issues before they said, yeah, I'm ready to do something. So they, they kind of headed off of the pass. So why? Why is it so important to, to do this community work? You know, you're a biologist, just manage the bears. Local ordinances on garbage create a community-wide effect. Your most local government agency is the one that's closest to the people. If the state says you should do it, but no one else is saying you should do it, it's not the same thing. If your local homeowner association says, yeah, you got to do it, it's more backing, it's more support, there's more peer pressure to do the right thing. And you don't have to tell them how. You just say, it needs to be secure, okay? And so that's not prescribing something. So not being prescriptive is actually a good thing. Now, all these things have helped, but it would be remiss to not say money talks, all right? So we provided almost $2.1 million to local governments in 16 counties with the most human bear conflicts to get them bears and equipment. Either it was cans or hardware that you can add to a regular trash can and make it more bear resistant. And the bulk of that went to local governments that had ordinances, they passed ordinances. So five counties, three cities, and multiple homeowner associations passed ordinances, got funding. There's no question in my mind that we were able to incentivize this. The other thing is that every dollar that we got from the hunting permits went into this program. So over $300,000 of the 2.1 million was from the hunt. The other thing is there's a real effect of ordinances. So that orange area you see is a portion of Seminole County in Central Florida. So five years before you can see this heat map of core complaints, not all calls, but just core complaints. Then look at five years after. It is, it is number one, the call numbers are lower, but number two, it's more diffuse. It's not as intense. The number of bears that we have to catch and kill is far less now than it was before. The other thing we've been doing is training local law enforcement. So since 2008, we've been training park rangers, uh, sheriff's office, local PD, military security forces. Hey, when a bear shows up, you do not have to get the SWAT team out because believe me, we've seen it. Um, this is what you do. Uh, so we've trained over 2,500 staff from 120 agencies. And in 2021, we added panthers and coyotes to that training because a lot of the stuff we talk about is applicable to those species. We also looked into new technologies. So we've all heard of tasers. Well, they're also called conducted energy weapons. Um, and we did a survey and said, look, who's, who's using them? We know a lot of states are using beanbag rounds out of a shotgun, maybe pepper balls or paint balls, and some, some are using dogs. Um, but we wanted to see, well, who's using these CEWs? Because not only can you haze an animal, you can actually subdue it. So for the example, this deer's stuck in a hammock. You can temporarily subdue it, get that animal out of there and release it without chemically immobilizing, especially for, for um, ungulates. Chemical immobilization, you, you might have a death just from the stress. So that's something we're really interested in. So we contacted and we found out that 12 states and two national parks have been trained to use CEWs. But right now, only seven states and one national park use it. Um, shocking to me was 71%, it's only the biologists, their law enforcement don't use them. 30% both, and then 14%, it's only law enforcement. 
And then 86% don't just use it on bears. They use it on other species as well. And at that time, over 500 bears have been treated successfully with CEWs. So we decided to train our staff. So our biologists got trained by our law enforcement how to use standard use of the CEW. Then we reached out to the other states. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife agreed to, to lead a training with us with case studies from Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Virginia. So we did that virtual training with our biologists and law enforcement instructors and 10 other states participated. The idea is just like Bearwise, we don't have to recreate the wheel. Let's come together, let's learn together. So with all that, what's going on in Florida? Unfortunately, since 2006, on average, two people are gonna come in contact with bears each year. Um, what we've seen is, yes, it's possible that, that this has happened before 2006, but it's not been documented. Most of these are happening in central Florida, north of Orlando. Um, of the 36, half are female with young. But when you, you shrink that down to what about the species you knew the sex of, 90% female with young. And that's what we're seeing. It's the females are being defensive, and they're they're one swipe, you know, one one scratch, one bite. They're 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 defending their young. Sixty one percent involve dogs. We know dogs escalate the situation. Um, half do involve moderate serious injuries. They have to go to a hospital, and then half are intentionally interacting with a bear. Now, most of them are not intentionally getting hurt. Um, they're hand feeding a bear rotisserie chicken, and the bear spooks and swats them. Or the bear's going after their hog, so they hit the bear with a pole, and the bear turns around and hits them. Why so many in Central Florida? Um, well, we got a lot of bears. Last count was 1,200, and that's our highest density. So one bear for three square miles, and there's almost 8 million people right around where they are. So it's really, honestly, not a surprise. There's just a lot more opportunities for something to happen. Now, given our experiences, we do wildlife response training. So we call it an incident. We don't call it an attack. Um, and we had our first training um, at the Eastern Black Bear Workshop. And then we invited Montana and some other folks from out west to come down and train us. How do you guys respond to conflicts? And then we started conducting our own trainings based on Florida-specific situations like alligators, which most people don't have. So we've been doing that every other year since April 2016. Uh, the trainings include classroom exercises, but also we take them in the field. We mock up a scene. We see if they can figure it out. We have actors who they interview and see if they can mislead them. So it's a real, uh, you know, multiple day intensive process. And since we've had so many incidences, we've been able to help out other states that fortunately for them, they've not had that many. So in North Carolina, we went out and did, were co-instructed their incident response training. In Louisiana, we led their training. Um, and then this May, we'll be going to South Carolina and Georgia to help them out with their trainings too. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so. <laughs> So for those of you that are joining us um, via Zoom um, or YouTube, you can put your questions in the chat, um, but we're going to prioritize questions from people in the classroom because we're going to have to leave this classroom in about 10 minutes. So, um, so yeah, so questions? Oh. How many attack or how many incidences occur with tourists compared to our residents? Question is how many uh incidences occur with uh, with tourists as opposed to residents? So all the incidents that I'm aware of have been residents. Um, now, some of them not lived here very long, but the, my, my understanding of our data is that when it happens, it's somebody who lives here. That's a really good question. Anything else? Katie's got a question. Um, I just want to make sure I, I understood. Um, I, I actually feel like as I was, uh, as I was asking questions in my head, like the next slide, you would 
Like you just <laughs> kept like you just kept answering everything. I just want to make sure I understand you had um was it just the one hunt? It's not an annual bear hunt. Is that correct? You had one hunt and it wasn't received very well. And you haven't yeah. been able to institute that again. That's correct. Um and uh, at this time, it sounds like um, that's not on the table. Um, basically, we have been asked as of February to prepare a presentation for our commissioners because it's been you know five years since we've talked to them or just shy of that. So we are going to go to them um, sometime, you know, in the next several months um, and talk about bears. Whether that leads to bear hunting, that's going to be completely up to them. Okay, that's fair. I do have a, a follow up, a different, a different question then. Sure. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, so um, one of my favorite things about Florida is actually your feeding laws, your intentional and unintentional feeding laws. So I, mm -hmm. I, um, I, I'm from North Carolina, and I wish. I wish that other states would just have legitimate <laughs> feeding laws the way that you all do. Um, but I'm wondering, um, how much of your success do you think you would attribute to the Bearwise program itself compared to uh, the the feeding laws that you have in Florida? You know, it's funny because I've been asked different questions about like, what about this piece? What about that piece? And because we threw everything in the kitchen sink, at this, I, I I can't, I really can't tease it out. I will say this though, that having bear wise and having so many states behind it, um, and when you talk to people, you remind them this is what we're all in a unified message. I feel like that brings more clout. And I feel like, you know, yeah, we've all been saying a lot of the same things, but not exactly the same. And maybe sometimes. I didn't, you know, Florida didn't say that, but North Carolina did. Saying the same thing, I think does help a lot. We really, really focus on education and outreach. We feel like that's the primary source of how to inform people. And, and you know, sure, some people will know better and they don't do it, but a lot of people just don't know. I mean, when you come to Florida, you probably expect sharks and alligators. You don't expect bears. So, you have to start way back with, yes, we actually have bears. Then you have to say, and this is how you avoid conflict. So, um, you know, that's a major focus, but I, I really couldn't tell because we, we didn't, you know, if we were good scientists, we would just pick one thing and go for five years and work on that and then say, okay, how'd that work? And then pick another thing. But we really threw absolutely everything you can think of that other states were doing. And we just said, we need to, we need to do everything we can to reduce safety risk in Florida. It's impressive. Yeah. You had a question, Chris? Uh, first, when I come to Florida, I expect uh, Argentine Cajun lizards, but good um, call. <laughs> tasty. But my mom lives in the Florida in the in the villages, which is in central Florida. And one of the things that I heard uh, from you was um, hazing bears with paintball guns. And I just had like this really frightening image of my Mom's like paintball club just going out and hunting bears. So is that is that like an effect? Is that still in play? Is that something that is trained? Like I, I imagine just citizens aren't out there paintballing bears. Yes, we actually encourage citizens to do it. So, <laughs> My mom's yeah. <laughs> and and honestly, the imagery that you're describing, I'm picturing someone in a golf cart with a paintball gun. And that, that's yeah, yeah. So. And, and let me let me explain where I'm coming from, because um, it's interesting when we first proposed this, the humane interests were very, very concerned that that's going to be like a new sport. And, and, and what I told them was, look, I'd be actually happy if it was a new sport, because the more bears are afraid of people, the less we're going to have problems, not only safety for for people, but safety for bears. I hate putting bears down, but we put bears down every single year. If those bears were afraid of people, they wouldn't happen. So, so it, we absolutely encourage people to use paintball guns and slingshots. Private citizens 
on black bears. You open carry paintball guns in Florida? <laughs> Uh, I have no comment on any of that. <laughs> any more questions? Okay, any questions from, I'm not seeing any questions from Zoom. Are you seeing any on the chat there? Okay, so if there's no more, oh, one more question. Um, I was wondering, uh, how you guys initially balanced um, stakeholders who might have uh, confl conflicting needs, say like um, like people who want more bears in the area and people who don't want more bears in the area or something along those lines, how did you balance them? Um, and it may be hard to believe, but having more stakeholder involvement, I feel meant that they had to interact with each other and listen to each other. And, and so you started getting, you started humanizing them. And I think they started seeing each other as like a person who has opinions that aren't just like strictly what their representation is. And, and I feel like we've had really good conversations with folks that are completely not on the same side on certain topics. But what we're able to do is say, you guys all want, you're interested in having bears in Florida, right? Yes. And yeah, it diverges after that. But shockingly, the more time they spend together and the more time they hear each other talk and have questions, I'm not saying that they're going to hang out you know, after the meeting, but, but there is, I feel like we've built understanding and a level of trust with the agency and a little bit with each other um, about you know, like, hey, I see where you're coming from. I don't agree with it, but I kind of get it. And so I think that's why there's a little uh, willingness to a little give a little bit. Um, certainly, there are certain things that they're just not going to agree on, but they're a lot closer than you would think. Like, the, you know, most people are, geez, we have too much development, you know, and they're going to they're going to agree on that, even though they won't agree on other things or, geez, I wish we had more uh, conservation land. So they start finding that there's a lot of things they agree on just because we're bringing them together a couple of times a year and, and talking together. And we used to meet in person um, during COVID. We changed it all to virtual and then we've just kept it virtual because we actually have more people who are able to participate instead of driving, you know, three hours to get to a one hour meeting. So um, but again, I think I think that that just that sense of community has really helped people maybe listen a little bit more than they would have. Good question. Yeah, that was another thing. I'm like, I feel like Dave, the more I listen, the more I learned about what you're doing in Florida, the more legitimately impressed I was, um, especially with the stakeholder input piece as well. That's, I mean, that's an impressive array of people. Um, and like, I feel like here we, we talk to stakeholders, but not to that extent. Um, and not certainly not with that diverse of a, of a group. I feel like- well, Getting Safari Club International and Humane Society in the same room together is that's no small feat. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'll tell you this: um, it's by necessity. You know, most states, and it comes down to one question: hunting. So most states have hunted forever. Um, we stopped hunting, and then we started again, and then we stopped. So if we want to talk about bears and how we manage them into the future, we have got to sit down with every single person who has an interest in it and walk through how we how we do that. Um, and so I, I, it's by necessity. I mean, I'm glad we do it because I feel like there's a lot of value to it. I know some of my counterparts are like, are you crazy? Why would you want to? It works. It works because we hear from them. And again, we've been meeting with the TAG since 2007. Even though the management plan was done, we kept meeting with them. And then we started meeting with them when we updated the management plan. And I'm not saying that they liked everything in the management plan, but I will say that I built a relationship and my staff have built relationships that I feel like they understand that, that we do, we're in this because we care about bears and we want them to be here in the future. 
And I don't think they doubt that. Whereas if you're not a part of the table, you're not there, it, it's easy to just dehumanize and say, the state just does this. And it's like, well, no, I know who that person is. You know, I, I've met with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are there any other questions? We have time for maybe one more. I don't see any from, oh, oh sorry. Uh, do you operate just out of Florida or are you, do you do multiple states? Um, we're just in Florida, but like I said, you know, because, because of our number of incidences, we've gone out of state to help other states with their training on how to respond if somebody's been injured by wildlife. But that's not, the agency allows us to do that, but that's not part of our thing. We're, we're just, you know, we're a state agency. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, very good. Okay, and there's there was nothing online, right? All right. Well, thank you to everybody for joining us. And so, and I'm going to say thank you again, Dave. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for participating in our seminar series. And don't forget, we have Katie Sartini next week in this room. So, thanks. So I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much, Dave. That was. Um... I also teach uh, human dimensions and you hit every single thing that needed. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. I don't know how to make are you um, going to the, I don't know with your new fancy job, are you going to the Eastern Black Bear workshops? Yep. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you then. Um, yeah. Now I'm looking forward to it. We haven't been able to have an Eastern in so long. So yeah, I'm definitely going. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be my first one. So. Awesome. Well, it's it's a, it's so different than any other conference I've ever been to. It, I, I I hope you like it. It's very it's a lot more interaction um, than it is just sitting there and being PowerPointed to death. So. Oh, I'm really yeah. I'm I hope so. I'm looking forward to it. Good. Good. Yeah. So I'll see you then. All right. Sounds great. Thanks again. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>